Um, Wendy Westridge, she is one of our partners with um, our uh, medical group um, Aetna that we have for benefits. Um, she will be demonstrating uh, this evening a um, Mediterranean chicken bowl with everyone. Um, I'm also uh, going to attempt to record this um, as well as she does the demonstration. I've never done that before, so bear with me. Um, during the demonstration, she will uh, ask a few um, questions. Feel free, just nutrition trivia questions, feel free to pop your answers in the chat. If you do have any other questions at all during the demonstration, feel free to come off mute um, and ask away. And with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, Wendy. Recording in progress. Mm, I think I'll, um, I'll say got it on the screen so that I can see everybody. Okay. My name is uh, Wendy Wesley. I'm a registered and licensed dietitian nutritionist, and I'm here in my kitchen in St. Petersburg, Florida. And um, as a dietitian, my overarching goal is to get people back into the kitchen. Uh, during the pandemic, a lot of folks um, used Uber Eats and DoorDash and uh, other kind of meal delivery services. I work with a lot of people who are a little, who got a little hooked on them, and they say, I, 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 for my budget and for my health, I want to get back to home cooking. And so I spend a lot of my time developing recipes that are very, very easy, um, using lots of um, pantry staples, no weird ingredients, no special esoteric stuff, just basic stuff. I specialize in high fiber, high color, nutrient dense foods with the idea that you are going to eat this nutrient dense food and you're not gonna be hungry for hours and hours. And um, that is how I help people lose weight, manage weight, manage diabetes, um, kidney disease, lower cholesterol, is with high fiber, high nutrient foods. So you're going around nourished, full, and not going back after those snacks that are uh, often made with refined flours and added sugars. I call it, you step on the sugar train and you are chasing sugar all day long or the flour train and you're chasing that refined flour all day long. And so how do we do this? We um, learn to recognize ultra processed foods, learn to recognize refined flours, added sugars and work them out of our diets. And then what do we do? We, what do we replace it with? It's, I can't just tell you to get rid of it. I have to help you with what do you replace it with? And you bring in nutrient dense foods, um, that are minimally processed, getting away from those refined flours and added sugars. So today I'm making, I love Mediterranean cooking. Greek and Mediterranean cooking is my favorite kind of cooking. I'm from the Tampa Bay area, raised on a lot, I'm not Greek, but raised on a lot of Greek food because of our strong Greek influence here in Tampa Bay through Tarpon Springs. And I just find it is the best way to eat. And every year, every January, the Mediterranean diet is rated the number one diet. And it's because the nutrients are very high, the color is very high, the fiber is very high, and it is minimally processed. Um, it is not the never ending pasta bowl at the Olive Garden. A lot of people say, so I get to eat unlimited pasta and bread on the Mediterranean diet. And really the Mediterranean diet is very, very vegetable, very, very plant heavy. Um, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, beans, legumes, and whole grains, some seafood, um, and some poultry. So um, I am going, the first thing I'm going to start with is uh, I'm going to do a half of breast of, um, this is chicken breast, boneless, skinless chicken breast that um, I got on sale at Publix. Sometimes Publix will have um, this on sale. I do, when they do have it on sale and it's in bulk, I do recommend you buy it and then you freeze the portions that you would need for your family. For me, um, it's just me and my son. Um, I can get away with one chicken breast for a meal. I know that doesn't sound like much, but I am supplementing with some plant proteins. As you're, you'll see tonight with the bowl, I'm going to add some chickpeas. So we're gonna have some animal protein, but we're also going to put in some plant protein and that is going to give us that fiber and those micronutrients that we need. Um, I, I am not vegetarian or vegan, but I find as I go through time, I learn more and more about nutrition and I get older, I am eating more plant proteins and fewer animal proteins. And the reason is because one is cost, two is fiber, trying to always, always increase my fiber. And three is to increase nutrient density and color. 
And where we see those beautiful colors, and you'll see the bowl tonight is just going to have beautiful colors. That's where you find antioxidants, those phytonutrients that are shown to prevent Alzheimer's, dementia, and some cancers. So again, not just the benefits of fiber, but also the benefits of all of those minerals, vitamins, other phyto, other uh, nutrients found in plants that are not found in animal proteins. Not throwing animal proteins under the bus. I am preparing them right now. But as we move along, maybe finding ways to eat fewer animal proteins and more plant proteins. I am using a plastic cutting board on top of my wood cutting board. Now I have this wood cutting board here and it is just, it, it doesn't move. This wood cutting board is always out and it is one of the things I recommend that you think about if you wanna do more home cooking is just to get yourself a big old hunk of wood, a big cutting board. The bigger, the better and the heavier, the better. And I definitely recommend you do um, you it be made out of wood and you do the vast majority of your cutting on a wood surface. It is just so much better on the knife. It is just a, just a much safer way to prepare foods. And um, the only thing I do not cut on my wood cutting board is raw meats. Um, will I, do I cook, do I cut some, some cooked meats on my cutting board? Um, I'm guilty as charged, but I will not cut, cut raw meats on my, uh, cutting board, my wood cutting board. Um, let's see. So what I'm doing is I am cutting these pieces of chicken into bite-sized pieces. And the reason I'm doing bite-sized pieces is when I do a bowl, I want every, I don't want you to have to have to have to, excuse me, have a knife and a fork. Um, I want you to just have a fork or if you're really fancy, the way I like to eat a bowl is with chopsticks. And um, so because of that, I like to make these pieces all bite size. Also, I've tried to make them uniform in size because when, when they cook and they will cook up really, really fast, um, I want them, I don't want some to cook really fast and then they get rough and tough and rubbery and then the other ones take a bit longer. So I'm trying to, I tried to cut all of the chicken into kind of the same bite size and these will shrink up as they cook. So I'm putting these in a bowl and then I'm gonna make a quick marinade. Not even gonna, I'm not one for measuring. I'm just gonna, um, when I turn this upside down, I count one second, that is one tablespoon through this spout. So one, two, that's two tablespoons of oil. I'm not pulling out measuring spoons. I'm not pulling out measuring cups. Do you know why? Cause I have to wash that and it is Tuesday night and I have worked all day. And the last thing I want to do is a whole sink full of dishes. So if the more you can just, uh, guesstimate, estimate, use some of your simple kind of tools like that one I just used so that you don't have to wash a bunch of darn dishes. Who wants to do dishes? Not me. So I've got some garlic powder. Garlic powder is one of my favorite go-to things in the kitchen. It contains no salt. Now I'm going to add some salt but um, I really like the flavor of garlic. I use fresh garlic and I will use that fresh garlic in the tzatziki I'm about to make in a minute because it makes all the difference. But to save time and to not kill myself, sometimes I just use good old fashioned garlic powder. It's okay, again, no measuring, just shake it on. I'm gonna shake on some salt, boom, boom, boom. How much salt? A little bit of salt, I don't know. If you really wanna measure, that's okay. I work with a lot of people who just feel more comfortable measuring and that's okay. How much salt? Half a teaspoon. Uh, that's the only one you really kinda of have to worry about because you can over salt this if you, if you went crazy with the salt. And then this is dried oregano. So oil, let's see, oil, dried oregano, garlic powder, salt, oh, and some black pepper. Just a little bit of fresh black pepper. Um, and so stirring that up, letting it sit for a little bit. What the salt is, I just lost a piece of chicken. Um, what the salt is gonna do is tenderize this chicken. The longer it sits in the salt, the more tender it will get. If you have time to marinate it, great. If you don't, that's okay too, not the end of the world. This is Tuesday night, we're trying to get dinner on the table. Fast, fast, fast is the word. Okay, I'm gonna set that aside, set that chicken aside. Next, what I'm gonna do is make the tzatziki. Now, this tzatziki, um, the longer it sits, the funkier it gets. And I mean, funk. when I mean funky, I mean through garlic. So the longer it sits, 
the more fragrant it gets, the more powerful it gets. If you like a lot of garlic, add a lot of garlic. If you don't like garlic, you don't have to add it. It really is up to you. This is one of the most simple things I make. It is wonderful on baked potatoes. It is fantastic on grilled meats. And it is great as a salad dressing. So what I have here is whole milk, plain yogurt. This is a store brand. I've used it before. I like it. I think it's fine. Um, if you don't like a, the store brand, I recommend Dannon. Dannon makes a whole milk, not light, not diet, not fat free. Um, I am a dietitian who likes fat. I like to eat dairy that contains fat. Now I don't eat a lot of dairy, but when I eat it, I want it to taste good. Fat tastes good. Um, and when I'm eating food, I want it to taste good. And um, especially when it comes to plants, I'm eating a lot of plant fat. Nuts, seeds, olives, and avocados, especially where the plant fats are, are concerned, do not be afraid of fat. When it comes to dairy and other animal products, if you um, want to be a bit more judicious about your consumption of those fats, I agree with that. But when it comes to plant fats, go for it. There is a point with plant fats where you're eating and you're eating and you just kind of say, I'm full. I mean, I, I have yet to meet someone who can just gorge themselves on, on um, olives and nuts and seeds and avocados. There comes a point where you say, you know what, I've had enough olives, I'm good, right? There's a, there's a, there's a shut off point with plant fats that you don't necessarily see with potato chips or cookies or other things. So there's an automatic shut off point with, with plant fats um, that I just don't um, observe with ultra processed foods. We, can, we have unlimited capacity for the combination of, of sugar, salt, and fat and flour found in ultra processed foods. And that is why they are so dangerous because we can just sit on the couch, watch Netflix and plow through an entire bag of Cheez-Its or box of Cheez-Its and we have like, where did it go? What happened? That doesn't happen with unprocessed plants. So I've got these, uh, this whole milk yogurt. I'm gonna add a little to the bowl. I'm just gonna make a smaller batch today this is maybe half of the tub, okay? And this will stay this will stay fresh in your refrigerator for quite a long time. It's because um, I'm going to add salt to it. I'm also going to add garlic to it. So bacteria doesn't like salt and it doesn't like garlic. And I have been able to keep this tzatziki in the fridge for about two weeks. It will not go bad on me. I'm going to do two cloves of garlic. This is a bulb of garlic, and the, the individual pieces I'm pulling off are cloves. These are individual cloves of garlic. And what I do, see, can you see what I'm doing? I'm going to smash the garlic under the blade of my knife using the heel of my hand. The heel of my hand, this is the most powerful point of my entire hand is this heel. I'm gonna put the, the clove underneath the blade of the knife, not that way, but horizontal and give it a good smash. And then what happens is the peel of the garlic just pops right off. Otherwise, peeling garlic can be kind of a, it's a pain in the pain in the you know what, but if you can give it a smash, your garlic um, peel will pop just right off. And I just cut off the little node where it was attached to the bulb. Let's do it again under the blade of the knife, heel of the hand, most powerful point. Let's see, here we are. There you can see, smash, good smash. And then um, again, the peel is just kind of coming right off, beautiful. And garlic is kind of sticky and it is stinky and I love it. I absolutely, garlic and onions. Anecdotally, the more garlic and onions I eat, the better I feel, the better my digestion. I am sure there is some good science out there behind that in the allium family, which both garlic and onion belong to. I cannot cite it right now. Anecdotally, I will say that I do feel better the more onion and garlic I eat. Maybe people around me aren't as excited um, to have my presence because of all that garlic and onion, but 
I'm feeling better. What I'm doing is I'm just giving this a dice with my knife. I'm not one for kitchen gadgets. Really the only thing in the kitchen you need are some, some good bowls, a couple of spoons and a knife and away you go. So putting this garlic into the yogurt. Okay, so right now I have three ingredients in here. I have garlic, I have salt, and I have yogurt. And that's it. And then the last thing I'm gonna add is I'm going to shave a cucumber with, this is a cheese grater. I'm just gonna use a cheese grater. You can use a box grater or a cheese grater. I cut it in half. I am going to include the skin, okay? Because there's a lot of fantastic fiber and phytonutrients in the skin. You see this beautiful dark green of the cucumber? I want you to eat that. Also, this skin makes the tzatziki heartier. So it makes it kind of stand up better on your food, on your potatoes, on your meat, and as a dressing. So in the bowl, I am grating the cucumber. Now, a cucumber is a lot, it's technically a melon. I don't know if you knew that. It has a lot of water in it. And the thing I wanna, the most important thing to know about making this tzatziki is that I need to squeeze all the water, not all the water, but as much water as I can out of this cucumber. If I didn't squeeze the water out, um, my tzatziki would be kind of runny. And I, I like a thicker, I like a thicker tzatziki. And as it sits, some water will escape because the salt that I put in this yogurt will draw some of the, the will draw water out. So it's gonna get kind of, wa it's not watery, but it's, it'll be a water, waterier product after it sat in the fridge for a while because of the salt sucking that uh, water out. So that's why I'm going to squeeze as much as I can. And the other nice thing is when you squeeze this watermelon, excuse me, this cucumber juice, um, you can drink it. You can drink the cucumber juice or you can add it to some water. It's incredibly, it's lovely and fresh, especially with as hot as it is outside to have a nice um, drink of cucumber water. So look at all of the water that I'm squeezing out. That's a lot of water. I'm leaving the seeds in good fiber. Um, you will hear me say the word fiber probably 500 times in this presentation. Um, it is the thing that Americans are most deficient in is fiber. We are chronically, this is a word I made up, under fiberated. We, none of us are getting enough fiber. So my specialty is helping people figure out how to get more fiber into their diets and not really from gummies. A lot of people say, well, can I just pop a gummy? I, su I suppose you can, but when you pop a gummy, you are missing all of this color. You see right here, all of these phytonutrients, minerals, vitamins, antioxidants, you're missing all the good stuff that plants bring to us. All the good stuff that plants bring to us. Okay, and I'm gonna give this last little bit a squeeze, squeezing out the water. If you want to see how beautiful the green, this gr look how green, I'm about to spill it. <laughs> look how beautiful and green this water is. This will go nicely in a glass of ice water. And you'll have a re very, very refreshing cucumber water. But I, I just love this, this green. It look, almost looks like nuclear green, but it's all from nature. Beautiful plants, all from nature. Okay, so I have all of the ingredients I need to stir up my tzatziki and I'm gonna set that aside and let it get funky. So I'm just incorporating my uh, cucumber into the yogurt and the tzatziki is done. Now, if I tasted it right now, it'll taste good, but it will taste much better in 30 minutes. And like I said, the longer it sits, the more garlicky it gets. And this is what you get on top of an Eero when you go to a Greek restaurant. Um, they buy it commercially. They typically don't make it in the restaurant, but it is one of the, it's so easy to make. Why not make it? You saw how easy it was. Four ingredients. Boom, boom, boom. It's done. Um, I have added, uh, in the past, I've added uh, bell peppers, chopped bell peppers. I've added cilantro. I've added uh, parsley. I've had it, added onions. I've added chives. I've added, like, kind of whatever is in the refrigerator goes in the tzatziki. It's kind of one of those clean out the refrigerator 
kinds of things. I've even added carrots. You can add anything to this dip and you can really bulk it up and increase the fiber. There's that word again, the F word fiber. Okay, I'm gonna set this aside and let it get nice. This is this is the dressing. This is what we will use on our uh, Mediterranean sissy keeples. Okay, have there been any questions? I've seen a couple of things pop up. Anything to address? Um, I have added some turmeric in the past and I've added some coriander and um, cumin and I could have, I should probably add black pepper, but you can absolutely add um, uh, spices to it. I'm going to add some black pepper while my pan, while my, my burner heats up. Um, you could add um, dried oregano, dried thyme, dried basil, or fresh herbs, any of those herbs. I mean, it really is, you could, you could, like I said, you could empty the, the refrigerator and put it all in the tzatziki. You can't mess it up. In fact, I think the more you add to it, the better it gets. I am going to cook this chicken in my cast iron pan. You do not have to use a cast iron pan. You can use a stainless steel pan, or you can use a non-stick pan, but I just kind of like the um i just i just love to cook meats in the cast iron pan so um this is heating up i'm going to set this aside i've put it on high a couple of things with um, cast iron you never put and this really goes for any kind of pan you never put cold food in a cold pan I, especially when you're cooking proteins um, i want you to heat the pan up all the way and get a little bit of oil going in here. And then I want, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna add the chicken. I'm not gonna put all the chicken in because what happens, people have a, a tendency to put all the meat or all the protein into the pan. And what happens is every piece of room temperature or cold meat that goes in the pan, you bring down the temperature of the pan, you bring down the temperature of the whole system. And then everything that was cooking and sizzling suddenly goes just kind of zzz, and it stops cooking and it just sits there and absorbs the oil. And so nobody's happy, nobody's sizzling. So don't crowd the pan, don't dump everything in the pan. Just have a little patience. Um, I'm probably gonna, this is a pretty good sized pan. I'm probably gonna do, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 pieces. And then I've got another eight or 10 pieces. So I'll probably do two batches. And the other thing is when the food hits the pan, resist the temptation to move it around. Now proteins will automatically release when they are done cooking. If you go in and you try and flip up that piece of chicken, I'll go in and I'll try and flip it and it will resist. It'll say, uh, -uh I'm not done cooking. I am not done cooking, leave me alone. You leave it alone. And when the proteins are done, they will release and then you will be easy, it'll be easy for you to flip them over. So two things, don't crowd the pan. And then the other rule I stole from Bobby Flay, this is his rule, let the pan do the work. Resist the temptation to move and shuffle and zhuzh things around, let the pan do the work. So this is getting warm, getting there, getting there. Gonna give it another minute. And then I'm gonna talk about some of the vegetables I'm going to, um, use and I'm going to talk about my vegetable humidor while this is heating up. Now this is something uh, I gave it a name. I, I call it my vegetable humidor. Just like if you're a if you're a cigar smoker, you're familiar with the concept of a, of a cigar humidor. It is a box that you is you keep inside a humid environment because you don't want your cigars to uh, dry out. Same thing, you don't want your vegetables to dry out. Okay, so if I I bought this parsley and if I just took it and I shoved it in my refrigerator over here, I would come back in the morning and it would be kind of wilty because the environment of the refrigerator is dry. It is not a humid um, environment and plants like water, plants like human. That's why we live in this jungle called Florida because it's humid and plants love it. So um, what I do is I put these vegetables into my humidor and see in the corner over here, I have a wet paper towel. Now through the process of diffusion, this wet paper towel is just, is pushing or allowing these 
plants to absorb water, continuously absorb water and stay nice and fresh and what we call in the plant world, turgid. We want to take this onion and give it like a snap. You hear that? Did you hear the snap? We want our plants to snap. We want to hear that snap. When you bite into an apple, you want to hear that crunch. That's turgid. That means that the cells of the plant are full of water. When the cells of the plant lose their water, that's when they get mushy and gross, and that's when you have that spinach soup that ends up in the bag. So everybody goes to Publix and you buy the, spin the bag of spinach, and you're like, I'm gonna eat spinach. This is gonna be my week, I'm gonna do it. And you put that spinach in the fridge and you come back three days later and you've got spinach soup in the bag. You've wasted the money. The, the spinach did not get in your system. You feel bad because you wasted the food and you feel bad because you wasted the money. So what I do is when I buy a bag of spinach, I put it, I automatic, I open it and I put it into my vegetable humidor and I will get a week and a half, sometimes two weeks out of a bag of spinach. The same with all lettuces, romaine lettuce, iceberg lettuce, any kind of lettuce. Um, so you see in here, I have these green onions. I will get a solid week, maybe even two weeks out of these green onions in the humidor. This parsley, I can't kill this parsley for one. It's hard to kill parsley, but in a humidor, it'll last forever. And I, you can see I've got um, the remnants of an onion from last night's dinner sitting here in the vegetable humidor. So as I cut a vegetable, like if I just use half of a bell pepper, the other half of that bell pepper goes in here. So this thing is like it's constant, constant rotating box of vegetables in my refrigerator. And I, once I started to use this, I extended the life of my vegetables three times, by three times. What this means is I end up eating all the vegetables I buy. Vegetables don't get thrown away in my house anymore because of this. And all this really is, it's a spring mix. I bought a spring mix, I ate the spring mix, I didn't throw it away, that's it. So if you get one thing from me tonight, get yourself a vegetable humidor and start keeping your vegetables in this thing. You will save so much money and you will eat so many more vegetables, which I assume is a goal for a lot of people when they go to the grocery store. They're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn over a new leaf, I'm gonna eat more vegetables. This is one way to actually make it happen. So I'm gonna get a little bit of oil going in my pan. Not too much, I don't need it because my cast iron pan is gonna be hot and a cast iron. I have a quick question. Yeah. Actually, a few quick questions. Yes, of um, course. How hot uh, should um, we have the pan if we're cooking at home? What temperature, like dial on a stove? Yeah, well, I've got this on high, and I've got it on high because I am cooking in a cast iron pan. If you're doing stainless steel, I'd say medium high. But the test, the true test is how fast does the oil run across the surface of the pan? And I'm about to test this. So what I want, when, when the oil is ready, it's gonna move really fast across the surface of the pan when I tilt it. And it's moving kind of slow. Too, that's too slow for my comfort. I want it to move faster. So that's a, that's a real nice trick is, it, does your oil move fast? So heat up the pan first, then the oil, test it. Does it move fast across the surface? then put, put a test piece of meat in. It should sizzle. I'm, think, I'm thinking if I put meat in this, it's not gonna sizzle. And then we had a few other questions. Yep. Come in. One is, um, so the, the paper towel that is in the hum, humidifier, yep. humidor, sorry. Humidor, uh, vegetable humidor. That one that you keep wet? Yes. Yeah, um, it's, not, it's not sopping wet but it's, it's certainly more than damp. Okay. More than damp, and yep. And how often do you change that? Um, it stays pretty wet because the vegetables have water, the paper towel has water, and they're kind of like, they're, they're all kind of keeping everybody nice and humid. So okay. it's a closed system. That's the thing, you gotta make sure your lid is on. If your lid is cracked open, it won't work. So you gotta keep your lid down and nice and tight and what we have is we have a closed system. Everybody in here, it's a rainforest in here. <laughs> and then the last um, question is that, that box of vegetables you keep in the refrigerator, is that correct? Definitely, oh, I'm glad you said that. Okay, here's the other thing. This, the vegetable humidor sits at eye level in the fridge. Eye level, not, so what we, what, here's the thing. Everybody's got them and they're called the drawers of death. 
it's where good produce goes to die. You spend a lot of money and you shove your produce in there and it gets all gnarly and nasty and you don't eat it. Those are called the drawers of death. And so what, what you do is you open your refrigerator and this thing confronts you every time you order, you open your refrigerator, okay? This is one hack to eat more vegetables because when it's out of sight, out of mind, you forget. Oh, that's right, I did buy some bell peppers. I was gonna put those in my eggs. I bought some green onions. I was gonna make an omelet. Blah, I bought some mushrooms, blah, blah, blah. I was gonna do some cool stuff with those vegetables. When they're at eye level, they're confronting you. They're right in your face like, hey, you spent a lot of money on us. You wanna eat better, you wanna eat healthy. Here we are, figure it out. So it's kind of a way to force yourself to eat vegetables, which is what you want, I assume is what you wanna do anyway. So in my pan, I have I don't know, about 10 pieces. Chicken breast cooks up fast. It is boneless. So boneless meat cooks faster than meat with a bone. So if you, now we've got these, these wonderful new boneless chicken thighs, which I think are a fantastic product. The cook time on them is much lower than um, chicken thighs with the bone in. So all meat that has a bone requires more cooking time, okay? So, okay, so here's one piece of chicken. I don't have to fight with it. It is releasing and I'm flipping it over. And what I have on it, I'm gonna show you, bring it up real kind of close to the camera if you can see it. See the kind of sear, that kind of nice brown on it? You got that nice brown, that's what we're looking for, that nice brown. So when you go to a restaurant and they, you know, they bring you this nice chicken and it has this nice brown, this is, this is what they're doing. They're letting it sit in the pan. They're not forcing it. They're using a nice higher temperature. They're not moving it around. Um, that's another secret with, uh, with hamburgers is you put them on the grill and you just, just don't touch them. Let them do their thing. Don't move them around. Let them sit and sear and do their thing. And all of these pieces, I'm not fighting with them. They're, they're cooking, they're finished. They're easy to flip. Don't overcook chicken. I mean, it's very, very tempting to overcook it, but once you take it out of the pan, it will continue to cook. And, and chicken, is, especially this little pieces of chicken breast, cooks very, very quickly. So try not to overcook it. It'll just kind of get rubbery and tough. If you wanted to use a nonstick pan, you can. The only problem with nonstick pans, you can't get them like hot, hot, like this guy is. This is a hot, hot pan. You can do that with stainless steel. So I recommend cast iron, stainless steel, but if you don't have that, um, non-stick works fine too. You just can't get it like hot, hot, um, the way I have this right now. Maybe one more minute and I'll do the, the last batch of chicken. That's it, I'm doing a very small little bit of chicken because uh, just I'm just, I like, I like chicken, I like animal proteins. I'm just trying to consume less of it. And then by magic, it's not, not magic, but it, it is, it's a trick. When you consume less animal proteins, you have to make up for it somewhere and that comes to you from plants. Okay, these are done. Pull a little plate and set them aside. And then get the other batch going. I am not doing a grain base on this bowl, but certainly if you had some um, some rice or some quinoa or farro, um, I recommend that I, I don't I don't recommend a lot of um, what I call big cooking. Like some people on Sunday will just cook for the whole week. I've just never been a person who will do that. Um, it's just not my, my style. What I will do on a Sunday, I will bake a couple of potatoes and use those baked potatoes throughout the week, either on a bowl or I'll scramble up some eggs and potatoes and put them in a tortilla for taco night um, or I'll just have a baked potato. The nice thing about it is after I've been out of the house and working all day, if I come home and I have a potato that's cooked, I've got something to start with. 
Again, a potato, surprisingly, a medium potato has six grams of protein. Most people don't consider that potatoes have protein. Again, there's that protein coming to us from the plant kingdom. Another thing I will do on a Sunday is cook a pan of quinoa or farro or rice or pasta. And I'll just, I'll just shove it in the fridge, keep it in the fridge. And again, when I come home from work, if I've been out of the house all day, if I have a, maybe I've got a rotisserie chicken in the fridge and some cooked quinoa, I am 75% done with dinner. The grain is cooked, the, the, the meat is cooked. Maybe I've got some canned chickpeas. If I don't want meat, I've got, I always have cans of chickpeas, black beans, pinto beans, other kinds of beans in the fridge. I always have a, a plant protein ready to go. So just a little bit of advanced cooking of ingredients, not meals. I think some people were cooking a lot of, doing a lot of like meal prep on Sunday, like cooking entire like pans of lasagna. I don't want to make a pan of lasagna on Sunday. I want to relax and chill and watch football or go to the beach or something. I don't want to cook lasagna on Sunday or, or something big on Sunday, like big meal prep. But will I cook a pan of rice? Yeah, I will. Will I roast a couple of potatoes? Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. That's happening in the background while I'm doing other things. Wendy, do you have any tips on how to uh, not overcook or undercook chicken? Is there any tips with cooking chicken to make it where it needs to be? Yeah, um, for instance, I just, this little piece has got, a, I don't know if you can see, it's got a little bit of pink on the inside. Of course, it's pink over here. Um, all of these pieces, I can see just a little bit of pink and I'm watching the sides of the pieces of the chicken. Now these are small pieces of chicken. That's why I did them small, so they'll cook fast. I'm, but I'm watching the sides for the pink to disappear. And then I know that the center, I'm not worried about the center because this chicken will continue to cook even after I remove it from the pan. I see a little bit of pink on this guy. I'm gonna let him sit. So I'm watching the sides for pink. And when I, on the sides, when I see no more pink, or no more, I guess, I guess it's the term, not opa opacity, because opaque is solid, but translucence, I'm looking for translucency. Now fish, if this is fish, the cook time is half. I mean, fish cooks, fish and shrimp cook so fast. When you go to a restaurant and the fish tastes amazing and the shrimp is perfect, it's because they know when to take that stuff out of the pan. And it typically was three or four minutes ago, right? <laughs> we all have a tendency to overcook shrimp and fish. It, it's, it, I've had to practice a lot to say, take it out of the pan, take it out of the pan right now because shrimp and fish cooks so fast. And then second on the list is chicken. Chicken cooks very fast. So this is very, very, this is pretty chicken. I can see the pepper and the oregano. I've got, it's kind of shiny from the oil. Um, I've got nice brown sear on it. And again, as, even after I remove it from the pan, I know it will continue to, to cook. And when I eat it in my bowl, I know it's gonna be nice and tender and not rubbery. So nice and, nice and pretty chicken, nice and pretty chicken there. Pretty chicken. Okay, let me set that aside. I'll put, a, I'll put a, um, a dish towel over it to keep it warm. And that'll also help it continue to cook. It'll continue to cook underneath the dish towel. So again, I just have a little dish towel and I'm gonna cover my chicken with it. Will my dish towel get a little chicken ick on it? Maybe, but that's what, that's what washing machines are for. Dish towels are one of those indispensable things in the kitchen that you just, I'm always covering food to let it sit so it can nice, stay nice and warm. That thing is hot. Let me get my pot holder so I can get it out of the way. Woo! It does take a lot of heat to bring a cast iron pan up to temperature, but once you get it going, man. Um, and then I, uh, of course, I'm sure you've heard about cast iron, um, punishable by death to put it in the dishwasher or put soap in it. Do not mess with my cast iron pan. I have two, I have big and little, 
and they are um, the big one is always out on the stove because I'm constantly constantly using it what I will do is when it cools off I will um, wipe it down with a paper towel get all the kind of the, the little bits out of it and um, or I'll rinse it with some hot water to clean it that way, but no, absolutely no detergents. How are we doing on time? Got a little bit of time. So now let's get to the vegetable prep. Did you know that bell peppers have uh, are male and female? I just, I learned this about, um, about six, six, eight months ago. This bell pepper has three lobes, one, two, three, and it is a female, it's a female bell pepper. And this bell pepper is has four lobes, one, two, three, four, and it's a male bell pepper. And I saw this cool hack on TikTok for cutting bell peppers. I'm gonna share it with you right this minute. So with my trusty knife, gonna cut off the top because when I teach vegetable prep, one thing I teach is gotta cut flat. We've got to create a flat surface because when we cut flat, we cut safe. When I'm, if I'm cutting like this and it's rolling all over the place, this is when I'm gonna make mistakes and this is when I'm gonna hurt myself. So I cut off the top, I turn it upside down. With the tip of my chef's knife, this is a standard eight inch chef's knife. It's the only thing in the kitchen that is essential. And then a wood cutting board and the rest of it, the rest of it is, you make it up as you go along, but you gotta have a knife, you gotta have a cutting board. These are the two things you absolutely must have in your kitchen. Um, this was not an expensive knife. Maybe this was a, a $30 knife. I have other knives in my drawer that are $15 knives from kitchen supply stores. They're fine. Um, hardware stores like Ace Hardware will sharpen them for you. They'll also, also sharpen your scissors and your garden tools for not a lot of money. And then there's a couple of um, farmer's markets in St. Pete that have knife sharpening services. So you, you could just go to Ace Hardware and get your knives taken care of, and then you are good to go. The safest thing in your kitchen is a sharp knife. The most dangerous thing is a dull knife. When you have a dull knife, you are pressing down very, very hard, and that's when mistakes happen, is when you're pressing down very hard. When you have a sharp knife, it is the cutting is easy, the movements are fluid, you are safe. I, I know it sounds a little counterintuitive, but a sharp knife is safer than a dull knife. So with the tip of my knife, I am going to cut along the lobes. Again, I learned this on TikTok. This is not my original, but I, when I saw it, I was like, yeah, that's magic. Look at that. So I've cut along the lobes, three cuts, because this is a female pepper. And um, what I did was I just came out with these nice three lobes and my my um, seeds, look how nice they just ripped out. Look how the look how my seeds just ripped out. This whole thing is edible. It's ready to go. It's ready to be cut. Same with this guy, seeds come out, ready to go. Seeds come out, ready to go. I Isn't love there this. Is a difference in taste between male and female? Not sure male and- probably getting there. <laughs> not, no, no, oh, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I love when people ask questions because it reminds me. Not between male and female, but um, all peppers start as green. Okay, and then they go to uh, yellow, and then they go to orange, and then they go to red, and then they go to purple. So that's why a green pepper is cheaper than an orange pepper, because the farmer had to um, nurture this guy longer than this guy. A farmer was able to pull this out of the, or off the vine and send it to market weeks before this one and that's why they're more expensive so they all start here as they turn color they they the starches turn to sugar and that's why a red bell pepper is sweeter than a green bell pepper this is this will be a more bitter than this people say well what's uh, what's the best ones and i say you got to eat them all that's eating the rainbow eat all the colors this one has different nutrition nu nutrition properties than this one. It's not better or worse, it's just different. And different is what we're going for when it comes to food. People say, aren't sweet potatoes better than Idaho potatoes? No, they're just different. Eat the sweet potatoes, eat the big russets, eat the white potatoes, eat the red potatoes, all of them. All of them bring their own nutrition story to the body. So, let me 
I do have a couple of seeds. Let me get those out. You see, I'm scraping with the back of my knife because I don't want to scrape with the with my my blade. I'll dull my blade, so I scrape. So I'm scraping something. I'm scraping with the back of my knife. I'm cleaning my my cutting board with the back of my knife. Okay. Again, these bowls, bite-sized pieces. Just making some cuts. These might this cuts might be too small. But boom, bite-sized pieces. And then these lobes. Now I I should not for the if I weren't doing a demonstration, I would not have cut those lobes, all these lobes off because the truth is another hack for keeping your vegetables uh, fresh for a long time, the longer they stay intact, like they did as they came out of the ground, the more life you'll get out of them. Okay, and that you may have noticed that with bananas. If you want your, I've got some bananas over here. If you want your bananas, to um, ripen, you should pull them all apart and set them next to some apples or some other produce because those other that other produce will release some uh, a gas called ethylene and ripen them. But if you want your your bananas to not ripen, make sure they all stay intact. Same thing goes with the pepper. If I wanted the max life out of this pepper, I would not have done what I did. I would have kept it all intact and then I would have greater life out of the pepper. So don't cut up all your vegetables and put them in the humidor. Keep them as, as intact as you can for, for longer shelf life. Okay, so I've got my peppers done. We set those aside. Tomatoes, again, with the tip of my knife, I'm just gonna core, let's see, can you see what I'm doing? Just gonna core it with the tip of my knife, pulling out the core, just a circle. I'm not gonna seed them. It's Tuesday night, I don't have that kind of time. I'm not gonna skin them. I don't have that kind of time, it is Tuesday night. I am just gonna give them a fast chop. Again, a sharp knife makes all of that possible. You see how quickly it's cutting through the skin. That's And tomatoes are a good indicator of whether your knife needs some sharpening, is if you can easily cut through the skin. What else do I have? Oh, cucumber. I'm going to eat the uh, the skin, fiber, um, antioxidants, phytonutrients, all in the skin, eat the skins. Same with potatoes, please, please eat the skins. Cut this guy in half, again, bite-sized pieces. The other nice thing about the vegetable humidor is that you pull the humidor out and all your vegetables are in there. You don't have to go rummaging through all these different areas of your fridge. Again, this makes um, dinner prep much, much faster. Okay, so got my cucumber, what else? And then my chickpeas. And so I have all of the elements I need for my bowl. Now we're gonna assemble the bowl. How are we doing on time? Oh, getting there. If I had a grain, I would put some grain in the bottom of the bowl. Grains could be rice, could be farro, could be uh, quinoa, nice, uh, or you don't have to use grains. Oh, I forgot my lettuce. I'm gonna use, um, don't judge, I'm gonna use iceberg. Iceberg was on sale today. If romaine was on sale, I would have bought romaine. If, if um, spinach was on sale, I would have bought spinach, but I buy what's on sale. And so I'm going to use some iceberg today because it was two for one and the heads were like $1.99. So I got two heads for $2. Um, and so I'm sure you've seen this trick. I'm gonna smash the core on the cutting board and the core is gonna pop right out, hopefully. And then hopefully my, my, uh, my laptop won't fall over. Here, good. And see my core just pops right out when I do that smash. My core popped right out. I'm gonna tear, again, I, I don't want to, um, I'm just gonna cut off a hunk of this. And the other hunk is going to go into my, what, my vegetable humidor for a long life. Um, I've kept the this kind of core, this interior intact and for longer life. And I'm just gonna give this a quick shred. Some people in your family may not like the darker uh, greens. 
and in which case um, perfect is the enemy of good so we can have some iceberg lettuce if the if that's kind of what your what your family will will eat because if you give them some iceberg lettuce and it also means they're going to eat some cucumbers um, peppers and tomatoes and some good chicken well then you've won so th things don't have to be perfect so I've got a bed of lettuce. This could also be uh, purple cabbage is, is great. Purple cabbage would be great or a coleslaw mix. Without the coleslaw dressing, I love a coleslaw mix. Again, that's one of those things I buy that just stays in the fridge. It, it's got, it's so high in fiber and low in water that a coleslaw mix will, um, will last in the fridge forever. So let's see, um, just like they do in the restaurant, they, what we do is I, uh, I make like a, I, I don't mix it all together. I put them what I call in pockets. This is, this is how they do it in restaurants. You see how I'm kind of arranging it. So it's got an area for the cucumbers, tomatoes, and the peppers. I've got my chickpeas, oops over so look at all that beautiful color look at all that beautiful color in my bowl let's not forget my chicken staying warm under my dish towel let's sprinkle some chicken on top this is one bowl but um i will make i will do this with an i'll do another bowl and this is what my uh my son and i will have for dinner and then last but not least, my tzatziki dressing. And you can do this on the side for someone. Someone can do, can dip on the side or I could just kind of dollop, dollop a little bit of the tzatziki dressing on top. Okay. And then last, if you wanna do a little, a little parsley on top, a little chopped parsley on top. Makes everything look beautiful. So I'm just gonna do some chopped parsley. If you wanted to do some uh, sunflower seeds, sesame seeds. Uh, if you wanted to chop some walnuts on top for crunch or some feta cheese. All of these things um, are part of the Mediterranean diet. And Sarah, do you want me to ask a couple of nutrition questions? Yeah, go ahead. Let's see, let's see if we can, if we know our nutrition. Okay. Um, I've been talking a lot about fiber. How many grams of fiber do women need per day? And how many grams of fiber do men need per day? Minimum, minimum. Grams of fiber per day for men and for women. Grams for women, 40 for men. It's if you did that, I would kiss you. That's that would be wonderful, but it's a, it's a little high. But if if About, you, go ahead. If, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, 28 for women, 34 for men. Really super close. Yeah, uh, 25 for women and 30 for men. So that is very very. That's almost like right on the nose. Yeah. So close. Yes. So yes. close. Yeah. So, tr okay, here's another one. Um, true or false, you should have one gram of protein for every pound of weight that you weigh. One gram of protein for every pound of weight that you weigh. True or false? Well, we got, well, we got kind of a mixed bag. A few trues and a few false, Most, mostly falses. Uh, good. The, the answer is false because um, that would be um, a lot of protein and most people, it's way too much protein and uh, some people have been told by some personal trainers in gym in gyms that say you weigh 165 pounds, bro, you need 165 grams of protein. Not true. Not true. 165 grams of protein is, is uh, almost impossible to do. It, it's, it's a full-time job getting that much protein. The amount of protein you need is roughly one gram per kilogram of weight. One gram of protein per kilogram of weight, not pound. Because the problem there is that we're mixing our 
uh, measurements. We're mixing English and metric and we never want to do that. So the way you figure out your kilograms is you take your weight in pounds and divide by 2.2. Weight in pounds, divide by 2.2, that gives your weight in kilograms, and that is roughly the amount, right there, that number you get on the calculator is roughly the amount of protein that you need per day. So again, I'll say it one more time, weight in pounds, divide by 2.2 gives you kilograms, and that is roughly the amount of protein in grams you need per day. Um, That's good to know. Actually. Yeah, and, I, and I'll, cl I'll close, I think I'm right up in time, I'll close, I'll take questions, but I just wanted to say that um, we Americans are constantly being sold protein, and I believe that big food has created a big fear around that they, they've got us thinking that we are not re receiving enough protein. We're not getting enough protein. And the truth is that most Americans are easily meeting their protein needs without, try, without having protein packed shakes and powders and other foods. None of us are meeting our minimum needs for fiber. None of us, none of us. And so that's really where I think in the next five to 10 years, fiber is going to be the star of the show. The best way to get fiber is here. The best way to get fiber is through food, uh, not through gummies, not through powders. Um, if you've got some severe constipation or you, your, your GI doctor will recommend uh, some powders, but if you're kind of functioning and you wanna lower cholesterol, you wanna be more full, maybe lose weight, um, certainly ramp up your nutrition. You will get it by consuming plants and plants are where the fiber is found. This has been amazing. We have had a few questions trickle in. Mm -hmm. um, one is, uh, we would love to learn about washing produce and what the recommend recommendations are for that. Okay. Um, there are produce washes out there. I, I haven't tried them, but um, the recommendation is that we just wash maybe with a uh, little bit of cool or warm water before serving and dry. So there are some uh, foods that are better bought organic. You can find those online, the Clean 15 and the does, Dirty Dozen. If you want to find a list of foods that are best purchased organic, um, I'm I'm always I'm always very careful with organic. I think that organic, I call it a dirty word because it creates a two tiered food system. Um, I've had people say, well, I cannot afford organic, so I'm just not going to eat fruits and vegetables at all. And the the healthcare professional in me, the dietitian in me, says, no, 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 no. Let's not um, <clears throat> let's not make organic create this this kind of go or no go when it goes when it comes to plants we should all eat plants whether they're organic fresh frozen canned i don't care people say wendy what's the best vegetable and the answer is the one that gets in your stomach that's the best vegetable the one that makes it into your stomach and that has to do with your cooking style your budget your storage style your preferences whatever so no judgment in the vegetable world just eat them eat plants I love that. We also had another question, Lolan. Um, if you are diabetic, how much fruit should um, someone have? Oh, okay. Um, with you know, with a diabetes diagnosis, um, there are some vegetables, or excuse me, there are some fruits that are lower in carbohydrates than others. Like bananas are one of are the vegetables of the higher carbohydrates, higher starches. Uh, berries are lower. So for people who have who don't have diabetes, I say unlimited fruit. Go for it. There's a point with with cantaloupe where you go, I'm done. I've I've had my fill of cantaloupe, right? I don't find that people gorge themselves on fruit. There's a shut off and it's it's because of fiber and it's because of carbohydrates and it's because of water. There's a lot of water in fruit. But um when it comes to um Folks who have diabetes, uh, they do need to watch for fruit. Um, more, insi more insidiously for folks with diabetes is refined flour. 
and added sugar. That is, that is the most dangerous thing for a person who has diabetes are the ultra processed foods with refined white flours and added sugars. Fruit is less of a concern. It is a concern, but it is not the concern that ultra processed foods are for people with diabetes. That makes sense. Awesome. We have a lot of thank yous and everyone's looking forward to trying this recipe. We have a few photos of people that um, were able to make the recipe mm -hmm. as well in the comments. This has been great. Good. Good, thank you. You've been a very nice audience. Um, any any questions, you can um, forward them um, on to Sarah or Bianca, and I'm happy to answer them, or I'll, I'll stay on if you want to ask something, you know, kind of more private. That'll be fine, too. Okay. Uh, oh, do you provide meal plans? I provide um, meal ideas like lists here, here's a, here's a, uh, a long list of some ideas. And the thing they all have in common is adequate protein, adequate, not high, 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 but adequate protein and good fiber nutrient density. That's what they'll all have in common. Cause I don't want you to go around peckish and hungry and looking for that next hit of sugar. I want you to go around full and nourished. I firmly believe that when you give your body real food, it rewards you with satiety. It says, thanks. We're good. We're full. Right. It looks like the majority of our crowd has left, uh, but th this has been phenomenal, Wendy. Uh, you put on a really great um, performance. I will actually end the recording. Okay. And hopefully, end it. Recording figure, stopped. Figure out how to find it later. <laughs> <laughs>